96. I recorded nothing on day 195. That was the Friday after that first uh, road trip for lectures in almost two years. My God, I forget. Or I forgot rather just how much you have to consider when you're commuting. I joked at the time of being away that I was so used to dressing well from the waist up that I'm somewhat clinically unable to wear dress shoes anymore. And such was the case when I was in York, suited up the top, trainers down below. Uh, all of that, um, uh, great memories being created led to me being somewhat of a bust ball on Friday. But here we are, here we are. Day 196, it's a new week. And starting that new week, we had in our team, uh, one of our longer group meetings, uh, a chance for someone to give a, a longer presentation for me to give some updates on other matters. But one really interesting point came up in questions that led me to say a little bit on a particular topic. That topic is going to be the theme for today. <laughs> And uh, that's also led me to look back at some old leadership blog posts on the, my Read and Deed blog from a few years back. But no, uh, without further ado, here, that question, that point that was raised in our meeting was around asking questions, not looking at possible answers based on what someone had written, not taking third-party reports of what someone has said and inferring anything from that, but asking someone directly for the answer to a question, seeking out answers by having conversations with people, be that reaching out to a corresponding author on a journal article, writing a letter to someone, phoning someone, reaching out on the basis of something they put out online, in order to get closer to the answer of a question that you've got for which you might otherwise assume an answer. Now, this is important f uh, on our side because at top level detail, we're looking at developing a technology with various end users in different parts of the chemical industry. It's exceptionally easy for us to go off and develop something without ever talking to anyone. We have the exceptional privilege of flexibility such that we can develop solutions where there might not actually be any problems. Now, there, of course, there's the argument on the academic side that a lot of blue sky research gets done without having any uh, end application in mind. And I've alluded to that in a previous blog talking about following mistakes for which there might have not been any sort of original plan or or premonition about what that work would be used for. That said, a lot of what we do in our team is application focused. And we're quite rightly looking at using the experience of end users as a means by which to direct future work. We, we take that feedback in order to move forward and spend less time actually just assuming what we think someone wants developed. Again, there is debate on this. I'm uh, strawmanning my own argument here by also thinking that, well, you can go down the Henry Ford line of inquiry and say, well, if you just keep asking people what they want, they'll say they want a faster horse rather than a car. All of these things are true. None of this is easy. That's why I'm... Uh, uh, dribbling this out uh, uh, in more words than I, I might have concisely wished. But all caveats, footnotes in place, a lot of what we do can be serviced by sense-checking various aspects of the work with end users and collaborators who are closer to the coalface of where we imagine it is that our technology will be deployed. We were thinking about this during today's group meeting and it reminded me of a book called The Mom Test. Now, a dear friend of mine had 
highlighted this book to me a number of years ago. That friend, a, a scientist turned venture capitalist, uh, has a great entrepreneurial brain and has been a fantastic help to me when I've been thinking along uh, the lines of business and entrepreneurship more so than academia. Uh, and he told me about this mom test book a number of years ago and at the time it blew my mind because it's simply about asking better questions to get the data, to get the research that you really want. And in the entrepreneurial world, that that is oftentimes missed by the trap of wanting to sell the solution that you have. What the mom test is, is a way of trying to frame your questions to a potential customer or potential end user such that all you're really asking is what they do now. What is their job? What are their pains? What are their gains of getting that job done right? Nowhere in that conversation does your solution feature. Nowhere in that conversation do you try to sell a solution to one of their pains or problems. You're listening to what they do now. It's much more data rich, much more valuable to hear what someone is doing now, to let them express what it is that they do in the fullest of terms and the way that they want to express that, to say what their day-to-day -day is, to say what the job, the pains and the gains are without feeling the pressure of you going to swoop in with your solution that you then want to present. They're not under any unease that you're really just waiting to say what you want to say, to present your ta-da moment, your eureka solution to their problem, and you're not actually listening to what their problem is. In fact, I said today that at least the first several conversations of, it, of these types, you should not have insert specific term here in that conversation, that specific term being, you know, whatever area of research we're working in, whatever research of area you're working in. It's a game of listening, genuine listening, to let someone air their grievances or just tell you the story of what it is that they do. And you know what? It might actually be that within that you find that what you're developing isn't for them. If they're interested, if they really have an itch to be scratched, they will come with the questions. The time will be right to present what your solution is. Up front, that is not the time. Up front, the time is for listening, not for selling. And so that's where we found ourselves. It reminded me of, uh, I mentioned an old blog post I'd written. It reminded me about talking along the lines of genuine conversation from a leadership perspective, ways in which that we can, you know, dispense with the small talk to get to the truly amazing stories of people. And how we can think about how to, not just what types of question to ask, you know, the mom test says to ask people about what they're doing now, rather than getting them to future till towards the solution that you want to present them with. Going more granular than that, then it's a good reminder of thinking about the likes of open questions versus closed questions. I've always had a terrible, terrible habit, and I'm still trying to break it, where I'll frame questions in a way that start with the word does. Does this thing that you've said mean that? Yes or no? Uh, does the paper that you've cited here compare to your work in this way or that. Uh, 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 rambling again. What I'm saying is I ask a lot of closed questions that lead to yes or no answers. What's far more valuable, as in the case of the mom test, is to ask something, not, not the likes of a question that starts with does, but a question that starts more like how. You've presented this possible solution to the problem. How is it that you have come to that? How is it that your proposal compares to this existing state of the art or that existing state of the art? 
The question is framed such that there is no leading towards a yes or a no answer. The person that you're in conversation with or interviewing or trying to get to come out of their shell to share something with a group, they are not led to yes or no, but rather to telling you in detail what their particular story is or how they arrived at a particular answer. And that the recital of that journey towards their answer might in turn lead to a far more richness of what their original and what their original answer was. Further still, he says as if he's reading something out loud. My God, that whoever says further still out loud. Anyway, that was a <laughs> a breather towards something I was going to say, and I'm stalling because I've forgotten what I was going to say. Oh, that's it. I, the, the other place that this open and closed question thing has come up is when I was putting together the research survey for my imposter phenomenon research and book, there was a part of that survey that was more or less closed. Someone would answer questions on a scale of one to five. There was no flexibility of interpretation. But what has been arguably more valuable in that but what has arguably been more valuable in that same survey has been the second part of it which asked open questions the part that instead of being on a scale of one to five or asking someone yes or no it's an open box the question is framed such that an open box is the appropriate place to ask someone to put their answer so maybe that's another way of thinking about how you can switch from closed to open questions. You can look at your original question and think, could that be answered by a tick box? Could that be answered on a scale of one to five? How might I actually reframe that question so that the appropriate place for the answer is an open text box? In other words, in summary, how is it that you might ask better questions to prompt fuller answers and more interesting conversations? I hope your week's off to a great start. I'll see you again soon for another episode of the Read Indeed podcast. Thanks for being here. If you like what you're hearing on the podcast, head over to the website where not only will you find the written blog versions of these podcasts, you'll find my leadership blog series, the daily thought series, and information about my book on managing the imposter phenomenon. We also have even more free resources and webinars linked to the YouTube channel. So head on over to dr-mark-read.com. That's dr mark with a c dash r e i d dot com. Thanks again for listening.